Okay, I think we're ready to start now. So um, first of all, welcome everybody to the first press conference of EGU24, uh, Europe's largest meeting of geoscientists. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, four exceptional speakers join us today to talk about their research. Um, and this year's General Assembly is in fact now our largest General Assembly ever with almost 20,000 abstracts submitted. So it was a tough decision to pick the exact science that we needed to present in these press conferences for your interest today. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers each in turn. They will give their presentations and then we will hold for questions and answers at the end of the uh, session. If you are joining us virtually, if you could please mute your microphones for the moment until the question and answer session has started, and then we will be able to allow you to unmute and uh, ask questions at the end. This press conference is press conference number one, which is titled Climate Compatible Energy in an Uncertain Future. Our participants today are Rossella Ionani uh, from the European Funding Development Warrant Hub in Italy, Elisa Kola from RWTH in Aachen in Germany, uh, Yasser Haddad from the Institute of Atmospheric and Climate Science at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and Dirk Jan van der Ven from the Basque Centre for Climate Change in Spain. We will start our presentations today with Rosella, and I will hand over to her now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So first of all, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's very good to be here with you today. Um, as uh, was said in the presentation, I'm a physicist and I'm working in Warrant Hub for, um, I, I think, um, almost one year and a half. Um, Warrant Hub is a consultancy company and we are uh, focused on European projects. So I'm here today to present to you one of our newest projects. Uh, which is called Hydra, and uh, the uh, topic uh, uh, around which the project focuses is hydrogen, and in particular the development of the hydrogen economy in the future. Um, there's been uh, much talk about hydrogen also in the general media. Uh, first of all, because it is considered to be renewable since it can be produced from uh, renewable energy sources, and so it comes, it is considered carbon free and a way to decarbonize uh, uh, the energy sector and also other sectors, for example, the transport or industrial sectors. Uh, and it is clean uh, because uh, it uh, doesn't emit anything uh, other than water vapor and energy when you use it uh, in principle. And it has a very big number of uses, uh, uh, not only in uh, uh, as a uh, way to decarbonize uh, the sector I mentioned before, but also it's a way to store energy, which means that you can use it to stabilize the grid, uh, but also since it is transportable uh, to uh, give energy to remote areas. So it has uh, many good characteristics. Uh, uh, and uh, um, it is considered one way to um, reach the goals of the European Commission in the future. Um, there are still some drawbacks uh, related to uh, the fact that uh, there are different ways actually to use uh, and produce hydrogen, which can be linked to uh, pollutant emissions uh, if you don't use renewable energy sources to produce it, for example. Uh, and, uh, of course, about the cost of the technologies, uh, because we are at the very beginning of the development of the hydrogen economy, uh, which means that uh, technologies are still rather costly. And also, if we intend to bring it in our distribution network, we have to invest also in terms of infrastructure. So, of course, in, uh, we are still at the beginning and the cost is still high. Um, there are also some papers uh, uh, about possible climate impacts uh, of hydrogen, uh, which is not uh, a direct greenhouse gas, uh, actually, but it interacts with the other gases in the atmosphere uh, and can create some uh, impacts uh, in terms of warming. Uh, but we don't know, actually, uh, how this impact will be meaningful in the future. Um, some people are also concerned about safety of these technologies, but I mean, uh, 
it is something that goes uh, when you work with gases also with methane it is the same it just means that we have to develop also some tools to monitor leakages of this gas in the future not only uh, technologies to use and produce hydrogen and uh, since the most common way to produce hydrogen is uh, by water splitting there are some concerns about the availability of water in the future and also the accessibility to hydrogen uh, for all um, but yeah, it depends also on the state of the art uh, of the technologists for producing hydrogen. Um, so these uh, are some of the concerns that we uh, will uh, consider in Hydra. And we will try to uh, understand uh, which are the concerns of different stakeholders uh, and try to give them an answer. For example, from a point of view of the scientific community, uh, of course, scientists are interested in uh, the interaction of hydrogen with the other atmospheric gases and on the possible climate impacts of hydrogen. So in Hydra, we will have some model simulations, uh, uh, starting from scenarios of the future diffusion of uh, hydrogen technology in the market. Uh, and from this, we will derive uh, scenarios of uh, atmospheric composition in the future and also uh, radiative forcing, which means climate impacts, of course. Uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, technical and industry, industry um, of course, they want to know if there are some policies or, in, or in incentives regarding hydrogen and how will the hydrogen economy develop in the future. And to answer this, we will analyze the policies uh, at uh, European, national and also global level and do a market analysis to understand uh, uh, the feasibility of the diffusion of hydrogen technologies in the near to long term, in the mid to long term. Uh, and also, of course, policymakers uh, are wondering how they can approach this, um, so how they can give indications and how their policies could impact in the development of the hydrogen economy. So uh, starting from our simulations, uh, we will give some guidelines to mitigate possible impacts that we can come across uh, and give to the policymakers some guidelines uh, and policy briefs uh, so that uh, the development of the hydrogen economy can actually be uh, sustainable. And last but not least, of course, citizens are also hearing about hydrogen more and more. Uh, so they uh, are interested in knowing if the technologies are safe and if there are some benefits in using hydrogen. Uh, so uh, regarding the safety aspect, we will develop a monitoring tool and we will also test it in lab and in a, a real case study. Uh, and we will disseminate, of course, and communicate our findings uh, to every stakeholders, including citizens, uh, so that we... Uh, of course, can um, raise awareness about the sustainable uh, energy vectors of the future. Um, this is in line with the expectations of the uh, European Commission, uh, who asked uh, for projects uh, to assess uh, how hydrogen interacts with the other gases in the atmosphere, how it can impact climate, and for better monitoring tools. Um, so our um, methodology is to start from this policy and market analysis to derive emission scenarios from which we can understand the scenario of possible concentrations of gases in the future, considering a possible increase in hydrogen emissions, and then run some simulation uh, about integrated impacts, also considering uh, land use and water use. Uh, at the same time, develop the monitoring uh, system to uh, detect and quantify leakages of hydrogen, and then take all these uh, findings uh, to evaluate the benefits and risks, uh, and think about possible mitigation strategies and guidelines to deliver to all the stakeholders. Um, we are a consortium of uh, uh, eight partners, uh, Warren Tab uh, is uh, working on the coordination of the project together with B Warrant, which is our system company in Belgium. And we have other partners around Europe, uh, and uh, for example, Cardiff uh, in Spain, CNR in Italy, and Lancaster in UK. They are the modelists of our group. Um, 
while the Polytechnic Torino, uh, di Torino and uh, um, CERF are more focused on um, market analysis uh, and also on testing the sensor that we will, will be developed by Automa, which is a company based in Italy. And I will answer, of course, your question later on, but if you want to follow us, we have a social media and also a website and we keep it them updated so that you can see our latest news and findings on there. And these are our, our contacts uh, so that if you want to reach out whenever we are available to answer all, the, all your questions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rosella Ognani. Uh, we will now move to our next speaker, Alisa Kola. Uh, we'll just take us a couple of minutes to change slides. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your um, invitation. So I'm working at the Geological Institute at RVTA on the role of geologic geological criteria in the repurposing process of former coal mines. And my work is part of a bigger project uh, funded by DFG uh, with different disciplines involved, like mining survey, um, hydraulic and geomechanics. So first, why is it important to reuse underground uh, mines? Uh, because on one hand, there is a progressive end of coal mining activities everywhere in Europe that allow the access of existing vast underground spaces. So as you can see on the map, the coal basins in Europe. So in, in black, the hard coal, which means underground coal mines, and in brown, the lignite uh, mine, which are more open pit mines. So it represents a lot of countries in Europe and also vast areas. And on the other side, there is an increase of renewable energy um, that need to be stored for the heat and power to cover the supply demand fluctuation. So that creates opportunities to reuse those underground um, spaces as a reservoir for heat or power, um, yeah, a storage reservoir. So different technology uh, can be possible, such as underground pump storage, hydropower, compressed air uh, energy storage or heat storage, but also we can reuse the uh, underground space as a geothermal reservoir for heat production. So we look uh, at the technical feasibility of using hard coal mine um, for this technology with a focus on underground pump storage, hydropower and heat storage. And for this presentation, I will focus more on the UPSH parts. So how does uh, underground pump storage hydropower works? So it works like a dam that can produce uh, electricity from uh, by draining water from the upper reservoir to the lower reservoir by powering a turbine in the machine home. But it can also uh, store energy by pumping up the water from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir during a period of excess uh, electricity production on the grid. Um, so pump storage hydropower at the surface is already a well-known uh, technology, uh, but required area, area with uh, altitude change and has a vast uh, surface uh, footprint. So on the other side, underground pump storage hydropower uh, reuse existing uh, spaces in area which can be flat and um, um, and can um, yeah like you don't need um, all the type of area. So um, if there is already a semi underground pump storage hydropower that exists in Austria actually, that's called Nasville and was built in 2006. Um, but the underground space was newly excavated uh, to extend uh, existing power plant. So now let's talk about the mine side. Uh, so first the rock, so coal can be deposited in environment where other type of rock uh, can be also deposited in layers. So here you can see like, uh, for example, a section of the rock mass. Uh, so rock like sandstone, sealstone or shale, which means that we might have a high variation of the type of rocks and uh, their properties vertically and horizontally. And on the other side, uh, the mine. So um, coal mines in Europe are often deeper than uh, one kilometer and contain a large infrastructure network uh, with usually different uh, levels, so means depths of uh, coal production. So this uh, infrastructure includes uh, shafts and roadways that are used to access the mine and bring the coal to the surface. 
and this uh, infrastructure I remain to stay stable during all the operation of the of the mine production. Uh, and on the other side, we also have the underground space uh, excavated, uh, like excavated panel where the coal is excavated, but this area are not remain to stay stable long term. So the advantage of reusing mine is that we have a good qualitative and quantitative data sets uh, with the mining operators and combines with a regional geological survey, for example, it offers a really good understanding of the geology uh, in the targeted area. Um, here we look at um, a study example of a hard coal mine in Germany called Postbahanien that ceased operation in 2018 and was previously uh, subject to further um, study for already like underground pump storage, hydropower reservoir and heat storage. Uh, so our work right now is to use this knowledge uh, to really have a global um, understanding of this mine and uh, further potential reuse uh, for this mine and mines in general. So here I will present you the methodology that we have for our work. So first, the first step was really to understand uh, geological challenges that can occur during all the process of conversion of the mine from the initial condition of the mine with the different mine uh, characteristic, but also during the construction phase with a focus on the stability of the underground space and also during the operation phase uh, with potential uh, cyclical processes that can uh, occur during the filling and emptying of the lower reservoir with water. So for this first step, we already published a paper with an overview of those processes, uh, combining the different disciplines that are in our project, as I said, mining, survey, geology, geomechanics, and hydraulics. And when we understand those uh, processes and challenges that we can have, we can set uh, criteria, especially for my side, geological criteria that are in line with requirements that we have for UPSH in general, and um, especially with long-term stability of the underground space in mines, uh, productivity, of course, of the power plants for having a economical uh, sustainability of the power plants, and to be in line with uh, uh, local regulation for work um, and environment safety. And because we are in uh, we, with a big mining in story, history, we have this used data sets. And when we know um, the criteria, we can really identify key data sets for planning and development um, for further stability study. So first with like compilation and starting um, as this data to be able, for example, to build a geological model uh, that is really applied for the reuse of our future, um, yeah, future review of, of our minds, and also weighing the importance of the different data set that is available. Um, so now it's what we are doing right now. And, um, and that's uh, all of our work is really uh, aiming at aiding decision makers that are involved in similar projects um, to really uh, know clearly what they can need and uh, having a base for their feasibility study for similar projects. Uh, so I will conclude with the fact that um, this, um, the future of um, um, conversion uh, mines, like the future reuse of coal mines in general and mines everywhere in Europe is really uh, an interest that is increasing. And uh, like more and more papers are published in that topic. So really understanding the geology is really necessary to ensure the long-term success of those um, different uh, conversion that might be possible in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lisa Kola. Uh, now we will hear from Yasa Haddad. Please give us a couple of minutes to change slides. Yes. Thank you for your patience. Amazing. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for being here on a Monday. Um, so I'm Yasser Haddad. I uh, work at ETH Zurich. I'm a PhD student. And uh, my PhD project is embedded in a larger Swiss project called Speed to Zero, which aims, among many other objectives, to produce um, climate compatible, climate resilient transition pathways for Switzerland to reach net zero. 
So within this context, I'm uh, investigating the impacts of climate variability on hydropower. This is very convenient. We uh, already had a talk a bit, uh, about hydropower here. Um, and we're gonna look into how this impact So I just give us a second. Yeah, of course. Thank you. We're back. Um, so yes, uh, we are gonna see how this impacts also electricity systems planning in Switzerland. So Switzerland developed its own goals and laws for its energy transition. We can see this through a map of objectives for the energy system, but we can also see that through laws that either have already been passed uh, like the climate law or a bill on the security of electricity supply in uh, the near future in June 2024. And these constitute all important milestones. When we were looking at the bill on the security of electricity supply, we uh, saw a, quite an interesting um, point that was brought forward by the government, which was to limit the net winter import um, during um, so during winter, you're not uh, importing as much from uh, the other countries and you wanna focus more on the domestic production. And my point of concern is really to make uh, energy policies and energy modeling more climate compatible. So we thought, okay, let's take these, this policy and try to understand how climate might affect this and might affect more largely the electricity systems planning of Switzerland. So for this, we explore two scenarios. Uh, first of all, the one where we limit the net winter imports to five terawatt hour in accordance with the energy law that was proposed in Switzerland. And then one where we actually remove this barrier. We just set it in the model that we're using to a very high number um, so that we can actually make it use more and more winter imports. And in order to assess the climate effects on them, we're gonna take the lens of hydropower which is at the core of Swiss energy policy. And hydropower constitutes 62% of Swiss domestic electricity production. And in this framework, we're also gonna look at more specifically runoff river hydropower. This constitutes half of the uh, hydropower production in Switzerland and therefore a third of Swiss domestic production. So this is quite a substantial number. And why runoff river particularly, it's because um, runoff river hydropower is those hydropower plants that are built along the river network and these do not have a storage capacity so basically they are directly impacted by hydroclimatic conditions and therefore they, these are a great gateway into assessing climate impacts on, hydro, on hydropower so we developed a methodology uh, in order to assess those impacts going from climate data and some technical specifications of hydropower to uh, hydropower generation to electricity systems planning uh, all through different uh, models. And in the first part, we look at the climate impacts on uh, runoff river hydropower. And we can see that year to year hydroclimatic variability induces this nice ups and downs in uh, the runoff river hydropower generation in Switzerland. So there is a clear um, impact, a clear variability that we can see. And we can also see that there is a slight downward trend. This is in accordance with um, the other studies that have been done on, high, uh, on stream flow in, in Switzerland. Now we are going to take each of those hydropower years and we're going to give it to the model that we're using to estimate electricity system spanning. And with that, we see that monthly electricity prices reveal enormous differences between the different policy scenarios that we're considering. Uh, from now on, we're going to consider in orange uh, the limited import scenario and in green the non-limited one. The little shaded lines, the whiskers, uh, are the different simulations that we've done with the different hydropower years that we're using. And uh, one thing that we can see right away is that there is a clear uh, difference in the winter electricity prices. These um, 
show that there are differences um, in the way it be the, the model and the, um, the policies behave during winter. And one other thing is that we can see also that the gap between uh, the two policy scenarios are greater than the climate effect on them. The climate effect can be seen through those different, um, if I can try to point out, uh, nope. Um, ah, yeah. So you can see that um, the climate effect is those slight whiskers here, and the policy effect is this big gap. So we can see that the uh, climate effect is smaller than the policy effect. Um, however, we can see also that the different policy scenarios have uh, different ways to ad adjust to climate. And one thing that we can notice is that the limited import scenario exacerbates the climate effect with bigger spread between the different uh, simulations and the non-limited one actually dampens it. Uh, we're uh, much more um, concentrated. So we ask ourselves why. And this comes first from the total size of the electricity system. And uh, what we're going to see now is how uh, the size of the electricity systems uh, changes with the availability of water. So how much runoff river hydropower generation is given to the model. And first thing that we can see is um, if the plot empires, um, yeah, the, the animations are um, automatic. So one thing that we can see is that there is a clear difference already between the two policy scenarios with the limited import one being higher. And uh, also that the slope, so how much it varies between uh, low and high water availability also changes between the scenarios. Now, this difference in size comes from further investments in renewables. The, um, the first renewable energy that we uh, thought about at this point was uh, photovoltaics. Photovoltaics in Switzerland are the pretty popular option to uh, decarbonize uh, and to switch to uh, renewable energies. However, we see that this is not really affected by the water availability. Uh, so the next thing that we thought about was, okay, so what's the next uh, renewable energy that's cost efficient? Uh, in this case, for winter electricity, it's wind power. And wind power is actually quite problematic in, in Switzerland because it's not still not socially and politically accepted uh, across uh, all, all different um, parties. So uh, we can see that here, uh, wind power is the reason why there is such a big difference between the two different electricity system sizes. Um, so here we see that the limited import scenario relies on wind power, problem number one. Now, obviously, the non-limited import scenario relies on imports and exports as levers. And so we can um, deduce that in a context where we limit the uh, import scenario, we need to compensate the lack of water with a similar type of uh, energy. And in this case, it was wind power, which was the most cost efficient. And uh, in the case of non-limited import scenario, we're compensating this with imports. So finally, the take home messages are that there is an impact of, of hydroclimatic conditions on runoff river hydropower. There is also uh, a notable drying trend uh, that we can see over the period that we're looking at. One thing also that I had to encounter with my uh, colleagues is that there's a real need for more open data on energy systems uh, for better transparency and better research. Uh, this has been an obstacle uh, all, all along the way, and we hope that in the future, this will be much more apparent. Um, finally, in terms of the variability of hydropower generation, this can be compensated in different ways, different strategies with a technology that has the similar generation profile or with flexibility through imports. Finally, um, I wanted to emphasize that the main message to take away from this is that careful energy policies, the careful choice of energy policies, considering climate impacts, 
can lead to a more resilient, climate resilient energy system because some might amplify climate effects and some might dampen them. And this is why we need to take that into account uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yasser Haddad. We will now move to our virtual presenter, uh, Dirk Jan van der Ven. Please give us a couple of minutes as we switch presentations. Yes. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, um, I will be presenting this work on passenger transport decarbonization on the different equity considerations. I'm I'm uh, myself a postdoc, postdoc researcher at the Basque Center for Climate Change in Spain. And this is a work done in the EU uh, project called Diamond. Um, I, I will be in in uh, uh, attend to the ego in person as well, but from Monday morning onwards. So this this press conference came early for me. Um, next slide, please. So um, just uh, to get into the context of the of this topic, so I'm looking at decarbonizing the uh, demand for uh, emissions from passenger transport globally, and this is comforting with many hurdles. On on, on the one hand, like um, a cheap transport system has been on the basis of uh, modern infrastructure and planology and lifestyles. So uh, it's very um, um, the, our current way of life and infrastructure is really uh, based on having a certain way of transport. And uh, although there are, of course, always um, ways to do some things without transport, uh, there will be, always be a big demand for transport, uh, at least in the, over the coming decades. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to think um, we can uh, drastically reduce the need for transport. And also, uh, there's a lot of uh, luxuries uh, that, that we can call luxuries like private transport and exotic holiday trips that are highly culturized and um, and sometimes idealized, which also means that there's a high income elasticity uh, for transport. And for non-economists between us, that means that like for every additional percentage or you gain an income, a relatively high share of that uh, percentage you share on you, you spend on transport. It's certainly, if you compare it to other energy uh, energy uh, spendings like uh, heating or electricity, um, and uh, policies to address uh, transport emissions are often criticized as being regressive, as they uh, affect the working class much, or they benefit the rich, such as uh, taxes on on gasoline. Uh, we had uh, this, the yellow vest movement in France specifically on debt, and they they managed to cancel that plan. We also have uh, subsidies for electric cars that are often deemed as um, um, as uh, regressive as they uh, get into the pockets of those people who can afford uh, a new electric car in the first place. So, uh, we, uh, so there are some. Uh, on the policy side, it's, it's not uh, straightforward to address um, these emissions and uh, from equity reasons. The next slide, please. So, if we look uh, at the current demand for uh, for transport services, uh, we see indeed a uh, very high in quality. Uh, this is another paper uh, with uh, a graph on another paper, uh, twenty twenty. Mm. Uh, we see on the on, on the on the x-axis on the left side is the population from uh, the less wealthy to the most wealthy, and on the y-axis we have energy use. So we see on the red line is uh, is the total energy footprint. So of course, always more wealthy consumers always have more uh, higher energy footprints in general. But we see that this is even stronger for land transport, but uh, much too even stronger for the air transport, which are the blue dots. Uh, we see that the wealthy top five percent of uh, in the world is responsible for fifty five sixty percent of global energy and CO two from aviation, um, and uh, we saw see uh, a high between and within country inequality in terms of uh, of transport service uh, access to transport services. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, but on the other hand, we also have. Technological progress, uh, which is uh, quite strong in the in passenger transport, despite having used fossil fuels for like 100 years without much change. Uh, in the last years, there has been a, a important surge in battery electric vehicles, at least um, 
for for private transport that has um uh, uh driven in uh in wealthy countries and uh, and specifically also in china uh until 2023 um we have we see this incredible increase that we see in this graph from bloomberg on the right hand uh and it also has search uh, this also has uh led to a technological learning which made uh, the cost of batteries and battery electric vehicles to come down uh, significantly at the same time as we see in the graph below and um another uh, side mark on this which which is like a base for the for the scenario that i'm running and i will explain in a bit uh, is that historical energy decisions has often been, often been driven by initial demand search of wealthy consumers. And this was also our core idea in the uh, strategy of Tesla, was our, our blog from Elon Musk like a, uh, a long time ago that he, he, he clearly explained that the idea of uh, increasing the scale of uh, electric vehicles, he first focused on, on the wealthy consumers with the Tesla Roadster, uh, then uh the, the they could increase the volume of of uh of electric vehicle production and that's why that way go into more cheaper uh variants uh of electric cars so this uh and this also has happened in the, in the past for other um services and um and and products um uh, related to energy use so um, there's a important thing in the, in the scenario design for uh, what I will be uh, presenting now. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. Um, in this study, uh, we use our integrated assessment model, uh, GCAM is, is the name, uh, with uh, updated with uh, heterogeneous income groups, uh, income details for passenger transport demand. Um, so for all kind of uh, transport services and we, we will be simulating uh, 1.5 degree compatible futures so uh, passenger demand is compatible with one uh, one uh, deep decarbonization basically so uh, close to zero emissions in 2050 um globally um and we are using two uh, equity considerations, two uh, different scenarios. The first is like the pay to pollute principle, which is often seen as the eco economically efficient solution, which is creating one global market for uh, uh, CO2 from passenger transport and let have uh, consumers to uh, 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 trade permits in, on, in order to uh, allocate who is, uh, who is um, emitting those CO2 and who isn't. And the second one is the equal emission principle, where like we have a separate market for each region. This cell that's like the most close we can model in uh, to equal emissions, uh, converging to us the same value in 2050. So we have, for example, the the top 10 percent in the US can, between them can uh, can emit the same amount of emissions uh weighted uh, of course by the population then the uh, less wealthy 10 percent in india which means that uh in the less wealthy 10 percent of india there might be a price of zero for computing because they will not get to this minimum in the first place but in the top uh in the top 10 percent wealthy consumers in the us you have a very high price in order to because everybody wants that uh that that those pyramids that to pollute basically and uh, we also simulate the potential impacts of the technology or learning from both uh, scenarios. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we look at the results. So we we have here the on all these figures we have from the left to the right like uh, global population from less wealthy to more wealthy uh, in the different details and different countries. Um, and on the and on the y-axis we have different uh, values. So uh, on the left see we see the the carbon price burden. So if you have a global private paper to pollute uh, um, policy, we see one carbon price that is uh, the same for everyone. We have equal emissions, and the carbon price is defined by the, the demand in every group. In that. so we see that this price uh, is actually in the equal emissions one zero for the poorest households, and then gets to us very high values for the most wealthy. Uh, uh, uh household uh but and if we address uh if you look at the amount of service 
for for per consumer. So the orange lines are always the pay to pollute, uh, so equal carbon price uh, per household. We uh, see that um, there's more or less an equal impact on overall transport services and uh, clearly unequal uh, import on like luxury transport services like international aviation where the poorest household has a much uh, bigger see a much bigger impact of amount of uh, service because they cannot basically afford to the high price to pay for uh, CO2 emissions and those and well the wealthy households are also affected but uh, less significantly less but if we compare that with a uh, with a policy with um, uh, where equal, equal emissions per, uh, for each group, we see that in both cases, like the 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 less wealthy households are le much less affected, are still affected, but much less, uh, and the uh, more wealthy house households relatively more. But that is also based on a reference where they already have a lot more. So I mean, it, it's not that they will the wealthy households will have less transport; they will just have a a, a, a larger reduction. And then, uh, next slide, please. If we look into uh, technology, um, different technologies, we see uh, the global technology mix for total passenger transport, also for aviation. We see that, uh, of course, going to us, a reference to us, a uh, policy with uh, um, compatible with 1.5 uh, degree, uh, we see an uh, increase in the amount of renewable uh, technology, uh, certainly in electric and hydrogen technologies. Uh, for transport, but more clearly in aviation, even in aviation, where this, of course, very innovative and it's not uh, happening as of yet, uh, but maybe happening in the future. And this is uh, this effect is uh, much exactly uh, much stronger if, in the case of the equal emissions because the most wealthy consumers are uh, more pressed uh, and they are the most uh, one of that are most needy on on uh, passenger transport and they are more pressed to use uh, the, to um, use uh, more uh, more innovating technologies and this is more even the case for aviation than for for transfer modes because they the most as I say most of the aviation is in this top five percent of consumers so um they, they, they will uh, spent on new technologies in order to avoid the, this high carbon price. Uh, and if we assume a learning rate, so a learning rate of 8%, which means that for every doubling of use, we have a 8% drop in the price. This is, uh, we see this 8% is a quite average, quite a maybe a conservative value in literature. We see that in the on the right hand side, in the little scenarios with, with, uh, Equal emissions, so with a higher carbon price for for the most wealthy, we have the most learning because there is more uh, demand for innovative uh, for innovative technologies, and the uh, price of uh, the capital cost of light duty vehicles and airplanes comes down significantly. The next slide, please. So if we um, then see the the carbon price uh, taking into account this learning. Then we we uh, see of course that the carbon price comes down for everyone for in both scenarios because um, there's less cost, so it is uh, less costly to remove the renewable. So there's uh, a lower need for a carbon price burden. Um, but if you look at the transport services on the right side, uh, it's interesting to see, for example, that in the case of equal emissions, that the lowest uh, the the most less wealthy population is um, uh, is actually affected positively because uh, they have of course a zero carbon price, they face, but they face cheaper technologies, so they are they enjoy more transport services. In, in terms of aviation, they still enjoy less, but they, basically there's no impact because there's basically no aviation in those first and uh, those less wealthy uh, consumers, but uh, we see uh, an important uh, re uh, reduction of the impact um, uh, to uh, also for uh, medium and richer households in terms of beca because of technological learning, uh, because they have faced a lower carbon price burden and they can so there's basically more transport uh, with the same emissions uh, in this uh, in these scenarios, and this and this effect is stronger in the case of equal emissions because there's more learning in general. Okay, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Slide, We're running short of time. Could you yes. provide us with a yes. summary? Thank yes, you. Yes, the final slide now. Sorry. 
Um, so uh, passenger transport, as I say, is highly unequal. Um, it has a high income and system because of luxury demand in, in innovative markets with high cost for emerging technologies. And um, um, uh, economically efficient externality pricing uh, paid to pollute affects the service equality uh, even further. So certainly in luxury demands like aviation. But with a different tax system, this can be uh, this can be um, reduced. This equality and, and and inequality can be actually reduced. And that the technology switching uh, by the wealthy potentially improves learning for low carbon technologies, improving access for all households. So that these are the key takeaways from this uh, research. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Dirk Yandervan. Um, so now we would like to take some time for questions. For everybody. So I would like to open the room to both our on-site attendees and our virtual attendees. If you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists, if you're on-site, if you could just raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. If you are joining us virtually, you can either raise your hand in the Zoom chat and I will uh, call on you and you can unmic yourself um, or you can type the question into the chat. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to start us off with? Thank you, everyone, for your for your talks. Um, yeah, so I just this is a broad question, but obviously these are really urgent issues. How quickly can we make these changes um, to our society? For instance, hydrogen infrastructure and that sort of thing. Sorry, it's a bit of a difficult question. Thank okay, you. So yeah, um, we have objectives, of course, uh, with the Green Deal. So we have to make changes by the twenty fifty. Uh, but how we make them, it's up uh, for discussion. Maybe to emphasize the point of how to make them, because obviously we have a target in 2050, but the pathway to get to this target is still up there. Um, and through my talk, I talked about the um, different policies that are brought forward and how climate can affect them. Um, so it's very important that we take into account climate, not only climate, but climate especially, uh, when designing those pathways. Yeah, I would like to add something else about the fact that we discuss different technologies and different ways to either reduce consumption or like better way to produce energy or heat. Um, so all of those projects are working in lines with all, all these different technologies. And of course, like now everything is in a lot of research states, uh, but in, of course, like time to have this research state to the industrial um, scale, it, it takes a few few years. Um, but um, like there is a lot of ideas that exist and the most important is really to see like how much we can reuse from like especially from heat because in a lot of especially European countries during winter time uh, the biggest problem is the heat uh, so like how for from each like we have also those fatal energies so like uh, from like heat from like the sun heat from like power plant that already exist reuse all those heat and always have I have a bit this um, mentality of grabbing everywhere energy that already exists and store that and uh, reuse in proper way. Dirk Jan, would you like to also comment? You're muted at the moment. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, um, as I already mentioned, like the, the timing is is kind of stated by governments right at the point. We have more, many countries until 2050 to get to get emissions down to to our own zero um but uh, i think that uh, the indeed uh, to fill in the path the policy design is, policy design is very important so we cannot just assume that because we have this uh, target that, that the marks will just respond and we will get there so um, there has to be a lot of wise thoughts on on how to design policies to us to getting there lovely do we have any additional questions oh yes Hey, I just have a quick question about uh, hydrogen uh, because it's an uh, interesting take on it as uh, 
it's been proven to be very efficient, but the infrastructure is lacking. And uh, it seems like the biggest boom of this uh, hydrogen was maybe 20 years ago, where it was sort of on par with, for instance, development of uh, electric vehicles. But since then, uh, there haven't been as much uh, coverage of it, uh, mainly, for instance, if I compare it to electric vehicles. And so I, I wonder uh, how to bring uh, the, the public back into the, the stoke and into the excitement of uh, uh, hydrogen. So then there could be more of a public support of such initiative. Yeah, I think that um, we are actually investing or maybe the, the European Commission is investing in this year, for example, in the development of hydrogen ballets. And we have different projects that are dealing with hydrogen and all of us are uh, uh, also r raising awareness to towards the scientism for the importance uh, of uh, uh, finding different ways to reach their decarbonization goal. Uh, and of course, we have still some uh, open questions about uh, the use of hydrogen, but I believe that our project will answer uh, some of them and also solve some uh, uh, potential concerns uh, that also people can have. Uh, and regarding transportation, for example, that you were uh, inquiring about, uh, in Hydrogen Valley, the, there are uh, some applications related to the mobility. Uh, and this uh, actually gives people uh, instruments to invest in infrastructures too. So I believe that once we will have the results of different projects already, that also people will be more invested in this. Thank you. Any last questions? Okay, just checking online. Okay. Um, so thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us today, both on site and online. Um, this is the first of our press conferences at the GU General Assembly this year. We have a total of seven press conferences. The next press conference will be this afternoon at 1600 hours and is uh, titled Food Security, Water Woes and Tired Lessis. So uh, if you please join us then, either online or on site here in Vienna. Um, if you wish to contact any of our speakers for further uh, conversation, um, their contact information is available through the EGU press packs. If you require any additional help or support, please visit the media.egu.eu website where we can provide you with additional information. Um, all I have to say to finish is thank you very much to our panelists. And if you could join me in thanking them for their presentations today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>